Hey guys, it's Adam from Mr. Pixel. Today I want to sit down and have a quick talk with you on a Sunday afternoon when I wasn't planning a video. Um, I've just been backlogged with work and stuff like that um, because I'm getting an alarming number of emails uh, and a growing number of emails from artists 25 and under, usually. I don't usually get this from older artists, but younger artists who are disillusioned and completely in a panic about AI art. And I received three emails this weekend um, all in succession, more and more panicked about and and frustrated on whether or not they should even be doing it in the first place, whether or not whether they should bother being an artist in the first place because AI is going to come in and take over. The big machine is going to come in and swallow us whole. Instead of answering every single one of these emails, I'm instead going to just anybody who who contacts me, I'm just going to give them this link. And the reason being is I just want to get to the bottom of it and I want to put a stopper on Something that I have personally in my career seen happen many, many times over the last 20, 30 years. And I even did a podcast with the well-known artist from the YouTube channel Light Ponderings, Jeremy Vickery, which you can check out right over here, where we talked about it as well. We chimed in on the subject. We're almost identical age. I think he's about a, a little under a year older than me, who had exactly the same opinion as myself on the topic. And I want to bring you back here. I want to bring you back to this healthy mindset because when I hear people who, who are telling me that the quality of their life is being affected in a chronic long-term way due to their worries about what AI art means for us as artists moving forward, it's time that you need to hear from somebody older and more mature, somebody who's experienced innovation and the evolution of the artistic industry uh, and in fact, was there, thankfully, to witness probably one of the biggest artistic revolutions of all time, which was transitioning from traditional to digital media. Because it wasn't until I was already working professionally that we went from sketchbooks and watercolors and traditional paints to pencils and scanners and coloring things in Photoshop to then completely moving on to styluses and working digitally. And then soon, soon after that, we jumped into 3D animation. And 3D animation was very rudimentary, it was very basic, but then very quickly it went from being these very static, very cold looking geometric shapes and dino silvery dinosaurs jumping up and down to being to subsurface scattering and and ray tracing and and particle effects and cloth simulations and doing incredibly realistic magnificent things that we never thought possible and at the beginning of my career yeah as i've expressed it many many times my career took a bit of a kick in the ass because i was a traditional cartoonist at the time who didn't stand a chance in the industry and yeah my cage was rattled for a little while but what came of that what happened? Well, here's the, here's the spoiler for you. I'm sitting in front of you right now, 25, 30 years later, still an effing artist, aren't I? I'm still drawing. I'm still innovating. I'm still creating. I'm still growing. I'm still teaching. I still run an art YouTube channel. My life has been affected zero by all of these amazing evolutions these adaptations, these innovations in the artistic industry. And I've found these innovations exciting, empowering, creatively uh, um, uh, amazing because it's offered me access. It's offered all of us as artists access to creative tools that, that we never thought possible. Now, how a lot of artists, if you look at artists like Tyler Edlin, or if you look at artists like, like Cynics, or if you're looking at artists like Ahmed al Duri, if you're looking at artists, all of these different artists, they're, they're creating artwork using these tools, using these, in Borodanti, there's another good example, who, who embrace Anthony Jones. They embrace this new technology and play around with it. They toy with it in interesting ways. They look at this new fancy little tool, this little thing that they've been given, and they go, shit, what can I do with this? What kind of new stuff can I do with this? A really good example, if you're thinking about music, is somebody I've been listening to a lot, Jake, Jacob Collier. He'll make an instrument out of freaking anything. He'll make an instrument out of his body. He, he uses digital music. He uses traditional music. He gets these old 
ancient freaking instruments from the middle of nowhere, he'll smack his head against a wall. It doesn't matter. It's just another creative tool. And AI art is absolutely a very big deal. It's absolutely huge. As Monty Python would say, Oh Lord, you are so big, so absolutely huge, right? Yeah, it's big. It's extremely exciting. It's an uncharted territory. And like all uncharted territories from the beginning of humanity, it can be scary. Change is causes stress, even positive change. And not all change is all positive or all negative. There's negative that's going to come from AI and there's positive that's going to come from it. I'm personally excited about how we can use this as a, a research tool, a referencing tool. If I wanted to find very, very specific references that are nearly a certain character with a certain body type and a certain hairstyle and a certain look and a certain type of clothing sitting in a certain type of place with a certain lighting scenario on them. Building and putting together this reference would be monumental. If, I, if we go back to the days of Norman Rockwell, who, by the way, traced photographs. Oh God, he did. He cheated. Good Lord. I learned that from Ahmed when we did a podcast together. Check it out right over here. Okay. He, he traced... He traced his photographic reference, but the process he went through to compile these references was literally the equivalent of a movie producer who had to cast a uh, cinematographer and actors and, and location scouts and lighting technicians. And you'd have to get this whole freaking crew together to be able to photograph a little boy and, a, and an older man and an, an even older man and dress him up as a cop and a little boy and a, and a soda jerk in an ice cream parlor and photograph them in 50 different ways and play around the lighting and get a professional photo photographer to take the shot so you'd have a perfect reference sitting there to be able to take a shot and to be able to produce his illustration for the Saturday Evening Post. Is the fact that he used a camera to produce references, the fact that he traced those references, does that make him less of an artist? No, he's probably one of the most celebrated visual storytellers to date. He's one of the most iconic artists to date. Nobody gives a shit because the only thing people cared about was what, what, came, out the, what came out the back end of him, right? He took all this crap in. He took all this stuff in. He turned it through his system and pooped it out the other end and created a masterpiece with it. And in my opinion, what AI, the potential that AI has and how Adobe and all of these different companies are innovating and, and assimilating this, this, this technology is to produce a more seamless referencing resource for artists. So that instead of instead of going out and going up and down the streets looking for somebody, I can just type in some criteria to get the exact kind of references I need. Uh, think about just think about it for a sec. One of my paintings, Rusalka, okay? Three nude women swimming in a swamp underwater, drowning a man tangled in their hair and tickling him to death as he struggles for breath. Go and look that up. Go online and try to find those, try to find references of a nude woman, women, three, in a very, very specific pose, all making nice lines of action through the entire composition, swimming around with exceedingly long hair in swampy water. Go for it. Good luck. I'll see you in a couple weeks when you when you when you finally Frankenstein's together these perfect references and the adventure that you would have gone on to find these references to be able to get these images that you needed. Go ahead and do it. Okay, wasn't an easy task. I had to pull a lot of strings to get those references in place. But what if? I didn't have to do that. What if I just had to go doo -doo 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 and type it in and get some references sitting there and I'm good to go. And now I can just start to paint. That would greatly speed up the process of getting the ball rolling, which in essence, by allocating that time I would have spent referencing and gathering these body models and these location models and these colors and these and these particle effects and these underwater rocks and moss and early snowfall, all of the things that I had to look up to produce that image, I can have in about 10 minutes and then I can jump into my painting. Does that make me less of an artist? 
Does that mean that me as an artist has been replaced? No, just the grunt work. The grunt work's been replaced. And that's one of the main things that the advancements of technology have done over the years. They've allowed us to get over the laborious sides of gathering data, gathering reference together so that we can use those, tool, use those tools and do what we want to do more. Create. Explore. Right? Now, there is absolutely something to be said about the learning process and exploration. And a good example would be Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about what it was like to go to a library to find a book. You'd go into the library and instead of having access to a database where you can just type in something, a Google database where you just have quick access to something, you'd have to go to the library, you'd have to plan a part of your day. So you're getting fresh air and a good walk and you walk into the library, which has got a nice, nice atmosphere, a nice studious atmosphere. And you go into these Rolodexes and you flip through the cards. And in the process of flipping through those cards, you've discovered other books along the way. You've gone off the beaten path and discovered that, holy shit, this artist that produced this book that I love has also produced another six books. Neat. And in the process of doing that, you've made discoveries. And those discoveries have helped you to grow. Absolutely. And I totally agree with that. But... I also go off the beaten path all the time digitally using Tidal, my, one of my favorite apps for music. I'm always on, I use Tidal over Apple Music. Why? Because you go on the main page and it's got an algorithm that says, oh, you like that? Well, you might like this. Or Pinterest is another example. I go on Pinterest. I love Pinterest. I go on Pinterest and I type in some criteria and I'm looking up and gathering together my image references and I save them to my board and... It gets to know me and it goes, oh, you like this artist? Maybe you like this photographer. Maybe you like this costume designer. Maybe you like this sculptor. Maybe you will like this photographer. And you end up falling down this rabbit hole of references that helps you to grow and evolve artistically. What AI, the, the, the positive potential of AI, the positive side of it, is that it's going to make that rabbit hole a lot more efficient. It's going to help you discover, explore, and get to what you want to get faster so that you can grow faster. And if I look at artists today, if I look at where young, aspiring, professional fantasy illustrators, concepts artists are today that do what I do, I can immediately see how due to their them being raised in a world of improved technology from when I was young, because for me, when I was young, researching and gathering references and growth was a lot more laborious. For them, it's a lot easier. The access to resources, access to online schools, access to, to tutorials, access to Gumroad tutorials, access to, to podcasts and, and blogs and you name it. That I look at artists today and I can clearly see that they grow far faster than artists of my time. That their ability to improve has improved dramatically. And I'm looking at artists who are 25, 30 years old, and they're they're drawing stuff that wasn't even imaginable at that age. A frick when my daughter, Emily, when she was like 18, she was drawing stuff that I that I, I wouldn't have imagined being able to draw until I was finished at least a college degree. And when by the time she's finished her college degree, I'm sitting there looking at her stuff going, I can't believe what's coming out of you. It's just unbelievable. And I, that same can be said for so many different artists out there. We're improving. Technology is improving us. It's evolving us. Where does it cross the line? It's all in my video right here. When they pretend to be you and slap your name on it. It's called forgery. It's called plagiarism. It's called identity theft. And there's many laws against identity theft. And as artists, when stuff like this happens, a good example in one of the emails I got, Carla Ortiz our hero, one of my biggest heroes artistically growing up. She's been, my, she's been my hero forever. I quote her to every single student that I teach. There's apparently some lawsuit going on. Let me know or link what's going on below because I, I haven't been aware of it. I've been too caught up in my own stuff. But uh, I don't know. She's fighting the good fight, I suppose, against something that's happened to her. Uh, I, I look forward to updates from you guys. But good. If somebody is trying to steal her stuff, if somebody is stealing her style, stealing her identity and claiming it as their own, if I can hold Carla's work and then and some AI generated shit or some 
somebody who created it, generated the AI, generated image and said, this belongs to me. And Carla's sitting there going, I know what I paint. And that definitely looks like my painting right over there. Then she has a right to fight that. That's called identity theft. That's called plagiarism. But if I'm got compiling reference images together, if I'm researching different artists, if I'm looking at Anthony Jones's artwork and I'm looking at Hardy Fowler's artwork and I'm looking at Cynix's artwork and I'm looking at Ethan Becker's artwork and I'm looking at Tyler Edlin's artwork and Carla Ortiz's artwork and you name it, am I a thief? Am I plagiarizing somebody? Or am I learning from the greats? Am I inspiring myself? Am I pushing my own boundaries by... by admiring and studying a higher standard of what it is I'm trying to do. It's not theft. This is how we grow. This is how we evolve. It's how we pass knowledge down from one person to another. I have no problem with that whatsoever. I'm excited about that. You have to understand something. I'm old enough to know. I've been around the block enough to see when new technology comes into the picture and... And everybody goes, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. This happened right at the beginning of my career. I At the very, very beginning of my career, when I first started, I was working on, I think it was like the PS2, something like that, where I was producing games for the PS2. And I was a concept artist. And we were doing everything in, on, a, on paper, on white sheets of print paper, sketching with our blue pencils. And then we'd line it in and then we'd put it through a scanner. I freaking hate scanners, never liked them. And... We'd scan it in and then we started very rudimentary coloring them in Photoshop using the color pick tool and the paint bucket tool, yuck. And that was the process. And then when we started doing line art, we had to use the vector art and we were doing it with a mouse, God forbid, drawing with a mouse, right? It was a shit experience, but it was producing interesting things. And then thank God the stylus came out and we started being able to draw directly into Photoshop. And at the beginning, it was a little clunky and we had the little drawing surfaces, nothing too great. But then it grew and it evolved into something better and better. And now we have Cintiqs and we have iPads and I can sit down and do a professional drawing and I have access to 1500 apps on my iPad for 12 bucks a pop and you name it. We have access to so many amazing, very, very powerful tools. And no, my life didn't end. My career took a definite, got a good swift kick in the nuts when 3D came out and nobody was hiring 2D artists for a little while, yeah, and I had to evolve and I had to adapt and I learned 3D and then I had to, then I got into art direction and then I realized I could come back to traditional art again and there was that whole 360, but it was a 360 that brought new technique and new knowledge into the mix. Things get rattled. Cages get rattled sometimes. And innovation does come with its fair share of bruises. But that's fucking life. And if you're somebody who's sitting here going, oh my God, AI art, we're all doomed. You have my absolute promise without any doubt on this face that you're being a worry wart. The only reason you're reacting this way is because you haven't experienced enough evolution artistically. You grew up in a world of styluses and Photoshop, a world that didn't even exist when I started. You grew up in this world of digital art, completely taking for granted that this digital art world that you're in, that Photoshop app that you're using, the, the Procreate or the Art Studio Pro or the Clip Studio or whatever it is you're drawing in, is a very, very new technology with that pen, that digital stylus in your hand is a very new technology, something which you completely take for granted because all of this shit's brand new. And now for the first time in your life, you're going, oh my God, what's this new thing? And this new, exciting, never seen before thing is AI. And everybody's jumping on board and everybody's super excited about this shit. And I am too. And when people cross the line and they piss off the queen, Carla Ortiz, when they, when they step on her feet, she goes, choo, 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 and she puts her silencer. She takes care of those ones. Good. Then we have we have juggernauts like Carla Ortiz to advocate, to, to say, no, no, no. You're crossing a line there. That shit doesn't work. 
right? And has somebody ever tried to produce a piece of artwork, stealing shit directly from my stuff and stealing my style and saying, this is, an, this is, an, this is a genuine Adam Duff piece, or I made this even though clearly I know they didn't because I can literally compile the images that they stole from to produce that piece of artwork. I'll freaking sue them too. Because I have a right to, because nobody has a, nobody has the right to steal my identity. You're absolutely welcome to reference my work if you find something in it that inspires you, that says, shit, I love the way that shapes or textures or, or the colors that I'm using in its paintings and I want to try it out in my own to help me to grow. Awesome. Okay. I, this tattoo I have, these, you can't quite see them, but these two little frames have mandala art on it, but done by my artist, Julie Hamilton. I was massively inspired by her work as an artist and I evolved artistically massively just by her example and her aesthetic and I found a way to intuitively adopt that and integrate that into my own work and I'm proud about that fact and she should be too that she's she's been able to inspire an artist that isn't even a tattoo artist <laughs> right? Or clocks and colors that I designed a couple of pieces for that I, I put their rings on, I put their necklaces on and I look at it and I go, I can steal from this. I can be inspired by this and create something that I never thought possible before. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to produce a piece of artwork that was completely taken by her and Photoshop it into a different shape and call it my own because then I'm stealing from her. Then I'm, I'm, I'm taking her hard work and I'm trying to profit from it. And that's bullshit. If you're in a panic, if you're wondering whether or not you should even bother, then that attitude is the problem because that attitude is stopping you from growing. It's stopping you from innovating. It's stopping you from being confident about the next step that you take. It's encouraging you to give up. And that therein lies the problem. Giving up. Because if you get fed up and you say, fuck this AI crap, I'm done with this and I'm pff, screwed, I'm going to be something else because in 10 years we're, I'm going to be obsolete and you hang up your stylus or you hang up your paintbrush or your pencil and you quit, then AI won. And it's not because they did anything, it's because you chose to quit. Because at the first sign of stress, you gave up. And honey... I've seen, I've had my ass kicked so many times artistically, career-wise, but it only made me better. It made me smarter. It made me stronger. It made me more creative. It made me more focused. And that's what you should be focusing on. And if that day comes, if doomsday happens, if the big meteor called AI comes and slams down on Earth and destroys us all, then, well, you got nothing to worry about at that point. Because it's over and you'll have absolutely no choice but to be forced to quit. And until that happens, keep fucking drawing. Okay? All right. I love you.